going to be talking to John Scaife. Hi John. Hey Kay, good to meet you this sunny morning. Yes, it is. Well, I can't see much of it here because I've got the blinds down, but anyway. So you've got outrageous um, sunshine where I am. I love yeah, it. Yeah, well you've got a good view from where you are, haven't you? Haven't you? So, um, right, so I've got a traditional first question, which is, what do you do? I want to work that out, I'll tell you. <laughs> That's the best one I've had so far. <laughs> yeah so let's let's start from this perspective um i don't know what happened there that should have happened I don't know what came out. right i just get these notifications out of the way i don't know why that just flew up out of nowhere right so um let's put it this way you've got um an interesting life trajectory Let's put it like that. Um, perhaps you can tell me a little bit about how you've arrived at what you do. And I'm sure what you do will come out in the conversation. I Yeah. So I, I thought that was the question would be the first question. So I have an answer to that one. Right. Go on. Um, I... I mean, I, I did the whole University London thing and I liked in the city as, as an investment banker, pause all his... Um, it was sort of before it was, you know, the ruthless world that it is now. Um, uh, I stayed in it not because I felt comfortable in a suit, um, but because I was actually doing something which was quite interesting. I was financing largely feature films. There was only four banks in the, in the city financing feature films at the time. So I was sort of reading scripts and we financed record companies and TV businesses and all sorts of things. So that part of the job was interesting, you know, going down... Balls Brothers to, you know, to, to pour wine down, you know, superior people's throats to approve deals really bored me quite quickly. And I wasn't terribly good at it. Um, but all the time I was doing this, I was doing a lot of sport at quite a high level. And between sport and the outdoors, I just about stayed sane. Um, and then uh, I w was trying to control bribe, influence, whatever you do, um, an up-and-coming director to, to direct a play that I was doing. And this is really the starting point of the, you know, this is, this is I, I guess, you know, when I took the red pill, if you like. Um, the, I was asking this, di I invited this director to dinner. We were talking about favourite films. And I said, oh, and this was, put things in context, this was 1990 or 1991. You know, my favourite film is Kramer versus Kramer, uh, which probably is a film that needs some explaining to quite a lot of listeners. It's a, it's a story of a marriage coming apart and a custodial bat battle between uh, a still then young Meryl Streep and Dustin Hoffman, who is a very you know established star. And there's a sweet scene where Dustin Hoffman tucks his little boy into bed. And I said, I like that movie because movies in those days, you don't see very many movies where men express the soft sides of their personality. Um, and to wit, um, the director's um, wife perked up and said, you should go on this course that, that Richard's organizing. Richard was Richard Olivier, son of Lawrence, Sir Lawrence. And he had just invited Robert Bly and um, the terribly wonderful Michael Mead over to the UK. And that was the beginning of the men's movement or well, the myth of poetic men's movement, as it's some kind called, turning up in the UK. Um, so I always joke, and sort of the play that we were trying to di get directed, which Richard did go on to direct, was all about uh, sort of a uh, St. Joan. So I always saw St. Joan and ably assisted by, by um, Dustin Hoffman is what got me on this path. And all of a sudden I was one of 80 guys going through a huge amount of emotional turmoil in a hut in the New Forest, you know, living our own little uh, grim story for a long weekend. And I had buttons pressed and emotions come up that I never experienced before. 
Uh, and from that, there was then a very, I was so lucky at this time. There was a very long stream of, of, of teachers ca came over. Maladoma Some, who is um, now a name some people might know from Burkina Faso. The following year, um, Martin Prechtel turned up. We might talk more about him. He's been a big influence in my life. Um, James Hillman was there. Robert Moore was there. So um, I got bounced into this um, experience um, of, wow, he, this is the 90s, you know, and I'm also from the North where guys are supposed to be kind of like physically tough and don't express their stuff terribly much. And here we were being ripped apart on a regular basis every year by going through various poems and uh, reenacting dramas and hearing stories. Um, and at one point, Martin Prechtel told the story, the sum of which was um, the country's, countryside is doing fine, it's the cities that need the healing. And a little bulb, light bulb went off. And I just thought, you know, at a time when a lot of my friends were moving out to Totnes and places like that to get away from the big bag city, I thought, no, it's kind of like I need to stay here because somehow or other, you know, the deficit in sanity and, and, and love of beauty is in, the, is in the towns. The countryside's doing all right. And that's basically, I've been, so I've been walking both sides of the tracks for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, I used to joke. I used to say I sort of wore a suit in the morning and a T-shirt in the afternoon. Yeah. I wear a T-shirt in the morning now. <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. Right. Now, this is interesting because often when, when I do these interviews, very early on in people's lives, they know at some level, or perhaps it's not a knowing intellectually, but things come into play quite early on, like by the time they're five, in a lot of cases, that predict what's happening. Now, I'm suggest maybe suggesting here that maybe that wasn't so much the case for you, apart from the fact that you, you got involved in arts within the city because you were fundraising. Is there anything, is, you know, is, is, that, is that possibly your trajectory or was there something early on where you looked at things differently maybe you no know, i think well it's interesting um i think i was seven or eight and i was doing mock interviews with my dad for a school entrance for a school entrance exam and he sort of said what do you want to be when you grow up and i said i want to be in a band like the beatles and he oh, said right. don't you dare say that <laughs> And so, you know, so it's taken me about, you know, 40 years to get back to where yeah. I might have been. Oh, well, maybe that's, that's what I'm getting at. <laughs> We're lurking. I, no, I sometimes feel I'm living my life backwards. Yes, yes. Yeah, sort of Benjamin Button. Sort of, um, yeah, that's what I mean. There's something lurking um, in the psyche that sort of somehow slips out early on. This is the type of thing I'm, I'm meant. <laughs> so yeah, well, and you know, it's, you know, and and also you've got to see it in the context of the times. You know, we didn't have an X factor, and you know, mm. we we didn't have um, this celebrity culture that we do now. And in fact, you know, my parents were both school teachers, lower middle class, well educated people, and uh, music was just one step away from music hall, and that wasn't a lot of money. In fact, most people were aspiring to get away from that. Mm. Um, and so, you know, a good education, which I got at the expense of family holidays and the big house, um, you know, a good, a good education was, was the way out and, um, in, in, the, in those days. Mm. Uh, and, you know, my eternal gratitude on one level that I had a first class education and you, that was my way up the ladder mm. rather than writing hit single at the age of 21. Mm. Mm. It's interesting because, you see, I think I, I get this. Um, when I grew up in Cornwall, the idea would have been, from an educational point, that you 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 did well and you went to university and then you you became you got a profession, uh, and then you could come back to Cornwall. So obviously, to go to university, you'd have to move away, and you come back and you could be a you know solicitor, doctor, whatever, and and then life was good. So again, that would have been the thing. It would have been education. But what happened to me was I ended up moving back up to Kent because back to Dartford. So 
wherever you went there, it was like, well, particularly when I was a teenager, you know, every pub you went into, the landlord said, oh, you, you know, the Stones played you in that corner over there. You know, every pub, <laughs> whether that was true or not, was another thing. So that was always there, you know, that there was this other thing going on. Um, but yeah, I, I take your point. If you if you're not if you're sort of from somewhere else, you know, up north or down in the west or whatever, there was a, a different sort of viewpoint. It was about could you survive? You know, was there money? Yeah, it, it was about money, and you know, and I, and I think the other thing is, I mean, you know, London sucks you in. I was going to do London for four or five years and then travel, and all of a sudden, twenty five years later, I'm trying to find the exit. Yes. Um, yes. And, London, you know, especially, beast, you know, I, I, again, it's a sign of the times, but, you know, I ended up in investment banking because you could get a cheap mortgage in the days that mortgages were ashen and hard to get. And all of a sudden you're on the property ladder. Now, most people would do and hiss and say, there was a time when people would do and hiss and say, that's terrible. Now we have a whole population of people that can't afford houses. Yes. Um, and I think I mean, it's, in, it's interesting because we're now onto the subject of mentoring, which we may well talk about. Um, I didn't have anybody saying, well, if you do this, then you don't get that. Nobody's saying to me, well, have you thought this through? I was just doing what the guy who, you know, you know, two years before me was, you know, sitting in the next desk down the corridor. I was sort of just treading in his footsteps because he just sold his first house and, you know, made 20 percent. And it seemed like a good deal. And. My mom and dad were completely aghast and terribly proud that I had this job. They didn't understand what it was, and nor did I. Um, but that was that that was that was then, and I think um, a lot of people would sort of say, "Well, I don't want a ball and chain of a of, of a mortgage," and yet at the same time, they want some sort of housing security. Mm. Um, go figure. Yes, yes. So let's get let's get back to this um, transition point because I'm I'm really interested in this. So when you were when you were doing the first of all, how did you end up with with the job in the city doing writing funds for films? Because um, that's an interesting point in itself, isn't it? It was completely random. I I I, jo- I, I, I joined a big, well-respected American bank, which is all terribly all white and uptight, and really not me. I was still breezing in in the mornings with a kit bag over my shoulder and my sleeves rolled up, and this apparently wasn't the image they wanted with their clients. Um, and I just went through a headhunter. Um, so I will put my hand up and say that was chance. That was not me looking for a job in entertainment. That was a hundred, you know, that was the, 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 the lords and ladies of chance rolling in dice in my favor. Yes. Interesting. But I think significant. And, and, and then I found, you know, it, it was, you know, and it was one hell of an education. I was 24, 25 years old. And I was negotiating with Hollywood film producers who quite honestly are some of the best. You know, I think there was a book written, What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School. These guys knew all of that stuff. So I had a huge education in negotiation and bluffing and double bluffing and looking people in the whites of the eyes before you actually, you know, one of you had to veer off the road before you had a head on. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, was, it was interesting. And yes, I did the can red carpet and all that sort of stuff. So I had some fun with it too. Yeah, but so obviously that becomes the sort of doorway to the whatever what else happens um, for you, because obviously you met people which enabled you to you know obviously then meet people like Robert Bly, and obviously for a lot of people who don't know Robert Bly, um, I think probably his most famous book is Iron John, isn't it? Which is I, just behind you. I think I think he's famous for that. Yes. Exactly. Probably you're now reading backwards, but never mind. No, no, no. Um, it's good. Yeah. So um, Robert was a Vietnam protest poet. Uh, and what he noticed was a lot of wimpy guys. Mm. And he was like, what's this all about? And, you know, there was a lot of angry women. Again, you know, I don't know, half your listeners probably aren't old, old enough to remember this or know about it. Um, but the way that guys endeared themselves to women was to deny their strong masculinity because the strong masculinity was, was what was responsible for the war. And so there's a great dealing of the more powerful aspects of masculinity. Um, and Robert, you know, 
being a poet, felt into this, stumbled across this huge, great, big, long fable um, called I and John and reinterpreted it back about the need to step away. There's a very key scene in the storytelling of this, of, of, of this fable where to release the big hairy giant, brackets, you know, mature masculine, you know, the young, the young prince has to steal the key from under his mother's pillow. So there's a stepping away from the mother. Mm. Um, and off the back of this book, there, were, uh, there was a huge movement involved in America called the, you know, something called the Men, Minnesota Men's Conference. A lot of Vietnam vets were there um, trying to reconcile their own, their own rage, their own undealt with confusions about coming back into a world that was rejecting them because they'd been involved in something violent when they thought they were giving something good. Um, and then there was this new sensitivity around language. And then what happened is, is Martin Prechtel stepped into some of this space, again, coincidences with Robert Bly, and they started doing some quite profound rituals as a way of you know, addressing the hurts in people. Mm. Um, so you, you know, and I listen to some of the talks today and read some of the articles in the in, in, in the Guardian and places like that. And I can't help thinking if some of these people writing these articles were to dig out you know, on YouTube and find some old Robert Bly and Michael Mead talks. And Michael Mead's still going and talking, churning out some great stuff. Then a lot of the conundrum which they seem to be wrestling would actually be dealt with. Robert's very fierce and, you know, he probably would upset quite a lot of people um, well, he did. In, 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 in the work world. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. So when you when you first experienced that, you know, you you, you said it was in the New Forest. Or, um, what happened? You you went there. What what did you expect? I had no I idea what to expect. I had, I had no idea what to expect. No. But what was interesting, we set this up. Um, we were told on a Saturday night we were going to do a ritual and. I think I can talk about this. It was a long time ago. I'm quite c careful about talking about things which are sacred and sacrosanct and private. Yeah, yeah. But it's my stuff, so that's fine. Um, we were asked to find, to think about a loss or a sadness. And I'm kind of, you know, I'm at this point a successful guy. And, you know, I've got an attractive girlfriend, a lovely house, and, you know, not necessarily a career that I loved, but one that a lot of people were impressed by. Um, so I was kind of, you know, in early 30s, I was actually on one level, I was fairly chipper with the planet. Um, and then all this sadness started coming up, and I wasn't quite sure what it was about. Um, and I just felt into it and felt into it. And then we all had to line up, and we had to find something that we were going to let go that represented the thing that we had to, you know, the, whatever the sadness was. And I was suddenly overcut. So we were sort of lining up, and it was... Nothing more than a bit, much, bit more than a barbecue brazier, you know, if, if you're out in the middle of the night. But by this time, we've been drumming and singing and telling stories, and we've had um, conflict sessions and all sorts of stuff they don't do now in these worlds, you know, inspired by Est. And um, I, had a, I had an oak leaf, and I had, you know, picking this oak leaf up from beside my knee and dropping it in the fire was the heaviest thing that I ever lifted. Mm. And it actually was all the grief that I didn't even know that I was carrying for when my parents split up. Right. So it was a deeply personal thing. And I didn't even know I was carrying that grief. You know, you just got on with it. You go, you know, you have a family house and then one day you don't. Um, and mom lives in one place and dad lives in the other. And you don't talk about it because the people will get upset and you're too busy and maybe you go down the pub and get a bit drunk and you wonder why you got a bit more drunk than usual. And actually it's a whole pile of feelings turning up that are actually wanting to be expressed. But again, you know, we didn't have the language for this stuff that's now in every soap opera. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and so I experienced this huge ripping apart and, you know, I literally ran from the fireplace and, uh, and threw myself on the ground and howled. I just howled and howled and howled and howled. Mm. Yeah, I can, I can sense that already. I mean, I, when I listen to, you know, we've, we've spoken about these things before, not, not that particular thing, but I think what, what I, what I, 
what I think is interesting is how things like that can be locked away for so long, can be playing you in your life, you know, um, wanting to be, sometimes wanting to be expressed, but sometimes just making you do what you do in your life um, for so long. And then something can, can, can unlock it that doesn't actually seem at all logical. And, you know, I look at that from the point of view of, obviously with music, that's a classic thing, how creativity finds its way through like that. But of course, this brings us to the point, of course, that these things are ritualistic. It's the ritual. This was a completely non-verbal thing. I'm sure if somebody sat me down in therapy, I might have nodded my head, I might have got a tear. But this thing crept up, it sort of got round all my mental cleverness. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing which is really, really important is what the mythopoetic movement was about was around a contain creating a container. Yeah. Yeah. Guys are accused of not having feelings, mm. which is not true. Mm. Guys feel intensely. Mm. Guys are terrified of their feelings because they are so big, they're scared they're going to hurt other people yes. with their feelings. That's, that's very You've got 80 people in a room who've been through the same shit as you have. You're permissioned and you feel safe. Mm. You know that if, you know, you're not going to go into the, go down the bottom of the well unless you know there's somebody going to pull you out. It's too damn scary. And you also don't feel silly expressing your stuff if you just heard somebody else five minutes beforehand expressing his stuff. And so what was being created here was a very, very powerful container. Um, guys from, you know, 19 through to 79, it was guys who'd been in the first, you know, the first Gulf War and all sorts of stuff, who had all sorts of stories to tell. And so um, there was a container for these feelings to turn up that had probably been sitting there for ages wanting to express themselves, that were terrified of either not being received or actually doing harm to other people. I think the, the, the other point that you said about not looking silly is a really important thing when it comes to men. Why, I man, you know. Exactly. Well, I look tough or what? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's that sort of thing that instead of you looking silly, you, you reflect it out. You know, um, that is definitely a man thing. And uh, yeah, that's, that's really well put, John. Really well put. So you were saying that um, Martin Proctel comes into the picture um, and he is obviously a fascinating character. Um, again, I, I probably needs a little bit of explaining about who he is. Yeah, we need to just watch it. Martin could take over the rest of this hour. Yes, um, I know. Well, we'll, keep it, <laughs> we'll try and keep him under control, shall we? <laughs> um, anyway, very briefly, Ma Ma Martin Fractal has written lots of books. You can read all about him. Um, he's an amazing polymath, um, a very generous man, an initiated shaman in the Mayan tradition, um, who started uh, work uh, with Robert Bly, came over here, and then started doing rituals. What he did over here was everybody would have their own personal ritual, which might be, you know, uh, but Martin's biggest thing is about feeding. So and, and we're now getting into some quite esoteric territory and people might struggle with the language. Um, Martin's whole thing is about creating beauty to feed the thing unseen, which he calls the holy, that feeds us, that keeps us alive. Um, and he would say that we all have a wild soul that runs around and thank God, you know, can't get captured. And that's the part of us that we forget about. And every now and again turns up we have an aha moment where we go, oh, yes, that's not me. That's, you know. So Martin was doing these quite, you know, lo lovely three-day rituals um, where we would make an individual thing, which we would then bind together to become a communal thing, which would then be put out in the wilds. And normally the day after we left, a storm or a hurricane would come by and destroy the thing completely. Mm -hmm. um, 
he's a he, you know he's a singer and a silversmith and an amazing storyteller and you know, he breeds horses and God knows what else. Uh, and so he's, he was in the UK and then he started teaching um, in the USA. He has something called Bolad's Kitchen. And part of what he's trying to do, he started doing part of his job was uh, in the village he was in in Guatemala was to be in charge of initiating the young men, typically 13, 14, 15, into, into manhood. Um, and he started doing this in the, U, in the USA. And what he realized was you have to be initiated into something. And there was, wasn't a something to be initiated into because the culture that might recognize you and hold you wasn't there anymore. So Martin's has developed a very esoteric path which involves an awful lot of listening to music and understanding where music comes from and how it crosses over and how a song, you might hear a song that's traveled across the top of the Sahara because it's got a finger drum and then, you know, it's got a rhythm which you don't recognize because it's actually being played on a, it's actually come from the jungles in Venezuela from escaped slaves, but it's being played on a bass drum in the Congo because that's what they got left over from, you know, from imperial occupancy. And you know, to understand the interconnectedness of cultures and of peoples, um, and all of the time looking to the beauty in the way that these people, although they were going through all sorts of struggles, they didn't forget to honor the what what you near know, the wild in nature, the holy in nature, uh, and that's his big rant: is is, is to remember the, whole, the the holy in nature, the spiritual in nature, the thing that feeds us, uh, and we you know. I think we spent four years. It was supposed to be a four-year course I joined. We spent the four, four years just trying to understand the language to talk about things. And I stayed for about another eight years after that. Um, it's esoteric. It's very beautiful. Um, it, was, it was a very deep dive. Um, and it, it's, I'm, I'm encouraged now he's got some audio books going. And I, I hear people you know, just throwing out a phrase, jump up and live again. Yeah. I have no idea where it's come from. Yeah. Um, or, you know, it's good to see your face again. You know, they're Martin phrases. And they're actually, you know, English expressions of a compound uh, to to heal Mayan name, or Mayan, Mayan word. Yeah. Um, and he's a hard taskmaster. Yes. I think that's the, that's the thing that sort of comes across when you, um, obviously, I, I've never met the man, but I, I've, I've read a lot of his books, but I've, I've met a lot of people who have had some sort of contact with him. And I think the important thing is that for me, what I, I sort of recognize is there's a bluntness in a way of dealing with, you know, putting across an idea. It's got to be certain things have got to be said or done in a particular way, or certain things have to be secret not told well i think you know I, I would i would call almost call that warrior energy because you're actually being fierce mm. not angry fierce mm. in protecting the thing that you love mm. and that you know and these things also have a very long lineage um which people you know we're seeing a lot of horrible consumer spiritual lights you know, i call it spiritual you know, consumer spiritualism at the moment yes people not really <laughs> acknowledging what they're dealing with yes or acknowledging where it's come from yeah. or the sacrifices in the, and that have gone on to protect it or the roles that it plays in the lives of the of the tribes that it, that, it's, that it's come from and that it's and it's appropriate to be fierce it's inappropriate to be fierce to protect something so it can also go on being efficacious in its application otherwise the spirit of it will eventually will just run away there's just in that little bit that you've just said there are three or four things that we could pull on actually um, and I can sort of, because we're talking about, you know, creativity and stuff as well, because I've, I've always got this running in my head, how that applies. See, because I've mentioned a few times on this podcast about the fact that music has become a commodity. Because obviously within music, music in itself would fit in to to traditions, yeah. ritual, um, and it's an expression of, as you said, like feeding 
feeding the beauty, you know, the, the spirit of, of things. And certainly music was definitely part of that process. But it is, it, it's not a process either. It's the thing itself, you know. Um, and there's a sort of, I see a lot of dishonesty within music. I don't mean that in the logical, literal sense of, of you know, people making money out of it, but it's the fact that there is something about honoring where music comes from. I'm not saying that we shouldn't appropriate things because humans do that anyway, but there's a, there's a manner of it being done. And I find it sort of troubling. I, and I found it troubling for a long time, but I could never put a, a label on it. I used, to, I, I used to call certain types of music, um, you know, coffee table music. You know, it's the sort of thing that you, like a book that you'd find on a coffee table that was just there. Yeah. To show. And there's, there's a lot of that in music um, going back quite some time where it's like, well, it's not really saying anything. It's lost its spirit. It might sound good, but it's lost something. So going back oh. to what you're saying about the spiritual, you know, the sort of consumer spiritual thing. I, what you, when you say that, I see that. I, I see that in a lot of things. Um, where there's something slightly empty, there's something missing in it. Um, I'm sure we're going to be able to explore that a little bit more because the trouble well, is... I, I just want to say a couple of things. I mean, you know, I think, you know, I, I've, I mean, I've been toying with writing a little bit. and I, You know, a lot of writers would sort of say, you know, what they're doing is they're plucking something down. Yes. You know, my best moments happen just behind my head. Yes. And, the, and there's also a price to connecting to that. It can be quite exhausting. It's great yes. when you're in the flow, but it can also be quite exhausting. Yes. You don't, you know, why, why have I spent the whole day doing nothing? Because I'm actually not ready to step into that vomit because it's, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. it, it gets you. Yeah. Um, but then there's also the thing, um, there is an inspiritedness. And that spirit also needs to be fed. I mean, Martina is very clear about this, that we need to feed the thing that feeds us. Yes. And the price you pay as an artist, if you don't feed the thing that feeds you, is your family, your health, your well-being, all these sorts of things. Yes. Um, that sounds a little bit dark. Um, but all we've done is we take, 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 take. And you look at what's going on on the planet right now. It's take, 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 take. Nobody asks permission. Nobody says please. Um, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, I, I read Neil Young's biography a couple of years ago. And he sort of said, you know, the muse isn't visiting me right now. And he's sort of chill with that. Yes. You know, he's not going, I must have you now because I've got to write six songs by the end of November. Yes. You, yes. you know, you know, it's a dance. Yes. And then if you're dragging your dance partner across the floor the way you want to go, one day they're not going to turn up. Exactly. So you've, you've hit the nail on the head. I've spoken about this, but I, I want to sort of go deeper in this than we've, than I've done with anybody else. Because you use the term, the, the muse, you know, because every culture has an understanding of that relationship with the source of the information, the source of the inspiration. You know, obviously the Greeks use the term, the muses. Um, well, the, course, the Greeks are the best, sorry to cut, it, cut across you, because it's relevant here at this point, Vic, is theatre, um, you know, was the, the Greek theatres were part of the temple. Yes. Because people understood that the gods turned up and you had a moment of catharsis and that was a holy experience. Yes. So the theatre, you know, so performance was, as we're calling it, you know, performance, music, the choruses, um, the gods were there because they were right next to the temple and the, and the, the two were woven. Yes. See, the thing about the muses is that there's an alchemy you are part of the process, you know, apart not just being a, a conduit for it, but you are part of the alchemy as the artist. And I've pondered this thing about, you know, the, 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 the 27, 28 club guys, you know, 
guys and girls who, who, who do incredible things and then die young. Right. Janice and Jimmy and all that, and yeah, or Jim two Morris and, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah, the list is pretty endless, isn't it? And you sort of look at that and you think, well, there's something in the transaction here. I'm not saying it's their fault. I'm just saying it's part of the way it goes. You know, something, it's, it's as you said, it's not, there is a payment somehow to be made. There's something in that transaction that is like any, any initiation, a true initiation. It's dangerous, isn't it? It's not something you can just sort of, go, oh, yeah, well, you know, there's enough. Because you don't know. And, and initiations often involve a wounding. Yes, they do. And the, the art is to make sure that it's a wound that, you know, in, 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 Indigenous initiations, it's a tooth being knocked out or a, or, a, or, a, or, or, or a tattoo, as opposed to actually driving your motorbike down, you know, down a road too fast, or, you know, looking for something and actually it's an acknowledgement of your aliveness, which the wounding is actually part of about. Yes. Yes. And I think that's something that we sort of, because we've sanitised everything. I mean, the whole, I mean, God, this hits so many things going on in society, you know, risk aversion and all the rest of it. Because um, you know we're we are moving further and further away from the acknowledgement of to move forward, there is a risk, you know, and the risk, as you say. Well, I'm not forward. even sure I'm happy with moving forward because basically well, it was normally um, it was normally armies that moved forward, you know. That's a very chin, good point. Step over the top, keep going. Um, I think what we need to get better at is staying still. Yes, the that's same still. Good. We actually don't need so much stuff. Yes. Okay. I'll take that point and I'll I'll retract what I said because, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. What I was trying to get at here was, you know, the the, the problem is we're using language that, by its very nature, the language that we're using, by its very nature, is going to trip us up. We are a you know, we are, we are, we are an imperial nation that's good at you know terms full of war. Exactly, exactly. So let's let's sort of sort of see whether we can navigate this a little bit because this is complicated. The essence of this actually is that probably very simple, but to express this isn't that easy. And this is obviously why poetry, drama, and music is a better way of expressing most of this. Um, but I am, I think this is a very important point that we need to bring in when we talk about creativity, whether that's to do with art, music, or whatever, which to be quite honest, is more or less the same thing. Um, there is, there is something in the stepping away from it's me doing this thing that I think is very important. So, what do you, what from your experience would you say? Well, I think there's this thing about ownership. You know, we all have a hugely overdeveloped sense of entitlement, and it's mine. Yeah. Um, I, you know. And um, the, the, the creative act itself, it's like riding a horse. You know, you've got to be in touch with a horse's mouth um, to feel what's going on. But you pull it too tight, you, you know, you're going to jar it. And you let go of it completely and it's going to run away with you. So this is give and take sort of, sort of metaphor. Mm. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I think in a world of music, copyright law, and God knows what else, or writing, whatever, people would say this was mine, whereas the most honest people, um, you know, you read um, uh, Wolf on writing, you know, she would say, you know, she's not in control of it. She, you know, one of her best books, she sort of said, I don't know if I've written rubbish or genius today. Um, but it's, a commit, it's, a, it's almost giving yourself to the process. Yes. Um, and, and, and so it's a sort of, you go, I go back to the dance metaphor. So like, you know, where are we, you know, where are we going to go today? I don't know. 
Uh, the flip side is you also have to have a direction if you're writing 350 pages of prose. So it's, it's a it's this sort of loose type thing. Um, but I, I, I think there is a lot of pride and a lot of arrogance. And I think when you get into competitive writing, I mean, co competitive writing's existed, you know, it's all Bella and Berryman and all of these people and the great artists, you know, you know, you look at the great, you, you, you know, we've just talked about Olivier, but there was a whole pile of people in, around there. They all, you know, they all competed around drinking and, 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 and womanizing. So the ego tends to get wrapped in all this stuff and call it mine. And I, you're a very, very lucky person if you manage to dodge that. Mm. Um, I, I don't have any quick, quick answers, Vic. I just didn't want to I, I don't think there, I, actually, I don't even know whether there is an answer. It may be just better, better questions. I think the problem is as soon as you get an answer, it predisposes you to a load of other implications, yeah. don't, doesn't it? Um, yeah. So, see, we, we sort of mentioned Martin and his work um, and obviously the, the thing to do about uh, you know sort of bringing sort of beauty back into the into the, uh, the way that we we deal with well we we trend again we're back on <laughs> choosing back in language yes yes it's it's tricky which is why it's important that we have a command of language and can speak well yes. But even, even the speaking well, um, you know, I'm, not, I'm somebody who, because of things like NLP, I, you know, very aware of, of how even words end up with things labelled on them, you know. Yeah. It's, it's very, very tricky. Um, now, you, you mentioned maladoma. Um, Maladoma Soma, yeah. Um, I think I want to mention them both in the context of initiation, mm. um, which is one of my current, you know, something that I'm spending a lot of time thinking about. Yeah. Um, Maladoma was abducted from his village by the Roman Catholic Church and then escaped and went back to his village when I think he was 15 or 16. And they said to him, well, you can't stay in the village unless you're initiated. But if you're initiated, because you're actually a bit too old, it'll probably kill you. <laughs> Which is an interesting dilemma to face. So he went through an initiation process. Um, Martin was in charge of um, these, these initiations. And it's this stepping into manhood. Um, but it's more than that. It's actually a part of you being acknowledged and you being seen. And, it, and Michael Mead has done a lot of this work, especially with people that, you know, young, young people, very often young men, but not solely young men at risk, because part of your soul is screaming to be seen and acknowledged for who you are. Um, I've just done some, some work with another lovely lady called Annie Spencer, yes. where we had some young women slightly, slightly older than in, in, in their teens, where we we created we we created um, a ceremony where, where they sort of got to the mid twenties and went actually we don't have all the answers to life and will somebody please help we need somebody older than us to you know give us some ideas and mark the mark the path and we also need to be acknowledged for what we've done so you need old you know older people and you need a community and we live in a society that's where the old people are still trying to get out from under the tyranny of youth, to coin a phrase Emily Lou Harris used. Um, so we're stuck in this tyranny of youth. And then, you know, the best community you can get is a bunch of Chelsea supporters in a way match coming back on the train. You know, um, whereas what people are, a lot of people are looking for, not everybody, some people are very happy just being in their Facebook gang, but a lot of people are actually saying, you know, this thing that happened to me when I was 13 or 14, there was nobody there for me to talk about it. And I'm still carrying it in the same, same way that I went. I, I was still carrying this thing about my family breaking up and I wasn't even aware of it. Um, so the initiate, so we could even take initiation beyond the 13 and 14 year olds where it's very often screamed for the most. Um, and so we all go through phases in our lives, which are turning points, kids leaving home, first job, first marriage, end of the first marriage. And we do the, all these things by ourselves in our little four walls, and it's tragic. And there's so much stuck feeling. And we all have very similar experiences, which is why 
which is the role, if you like, of the art that we do have in television and film. And, you know, um, they are the vo- they are the steric storytellers at the moment. So they're sort of like standing universal stories and not our stories, but the stories we can relate to. And in fact, there's a whole hunger. It's like, how do we actually be acknowledged for who we are? You know, in other cultures, you you go through these things and you'd be given a different name. It's, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a very big topic. But what you end up with, if you don't put people through this, you end up with what um, Robert Bly called the sibling society, where you have a world which is still run by children. Yes. And the children are still feeding on the breast of the great mother earth and, you know, causing havoc because of it. Yes. That's such a brilliant phrase. Instead of taking responsibility, adults take responsibility, children's children blame. Yes. Yes, that's that's absolutely brilliant. I was talking to um, uh, an, uh, Jim, well, he's British, you know, but he's from Jamaican. He was born in Jamaica. An, an, an artist called um, George Kelly. And um, he was talking about um, getting back to the sort of Nigerian roots of art. Uh, and he, he, he was saying about changing, changing names because he, he works under the name of Fowokan, which is a, a Yoruba name for mm-hmm. an artist, um, somebody who, who makes with their hands. Um, but this idea that the initiation that he went through um, in Nigeria which was his, you know, th- things happened to him when he was there, basically. And he decided that it was time to change his name. Um, and we, we spoke about the fact that that, was, that would have been what happened here. You know, if you went back to traditions of pre-Christian uh, traditions in, in Northern Europe, people would have changed their name. You know, they would have been given a name or earned a name. Yeah. Um, and that seems sort of like sort of obvious, you know, when you hear that. We, do, we, don't, we don't sort of do that anymore. Um, and we live with a name that's been given to us. It's quite peculiar, isn't it? Well, it yeah. makes it very easy for an industrial military society to actually run everything by calling people, you know, you, you, you go to prep school, you, you go to these public schools and everybody's known by their first, by, 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 by their surname. Yes. Um, uh, we quite rightly grieve deeply what we see happening to First Nations peoples now. We were once a First Nations country. You know, the Romans did it to us and then maybe some of it came back um, and then it got chased away by Christianity. And I'm not knocking Christianity. I'm just saying, you know, that's, that's, that's what happened. These things, with, these, these heathen ways where people would have an underworld journey uh, and be acknowledged and all of that stuff, would, you know, would, would chase, were chased away. Mm. Um, and then we have, a, then the next bit that goes with that, you know, is a huge decoupling from the land and where you're from. Yes. And, you know, we all have this image of the Aboriginal in Australia or the, or, the, or the Red Indian, you know, so-called in Native America, sitting there hitting the bottle. But we had our own gin crisis in this country yes. that spurred Methodism, you know, during a, you know, in response to industrialization and enclosure and separation from the land. Yes. We went, you know, people forget all this stuff. We went through all of this. Yes. It's in, in, you know, it's in our bone. Yes. Uh, and, it's, you know, and it's in our language and it's, part, it's in our way of being. And there is so much grief in it, we dare not touch it. So that hits a point about education, because I know Martin Practel says about this and how First Nations people, education was a, was a weapon of being able to deal with stuff. And of course, it, that has been used on, on us um, to stop people thinking in a particular way and get them to think in another way. And I'm really intrigued by this and the way that the history that I learned never really covered exactly what was going on. Like you're talking about enclosures. 
how land was stolen from people and given to the rich people legally. It's amazing. Well, there's, there's a wonderful book I got, you know, up here somewhere called The Book of Trespass, where, you know, effectively, you know, bearing in mind that in, you know, the days of yore before the, I think, the 1832 Reform Act, um, you had to have property to vote. Yes. Uh, and everybody just said, you know, I'm going to enclose my piece of common land if, as long as you approve it and you can enclose yours and I'll vote for that too. So it was a club. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the statistics on ownership in the UK is deeply, deeply grievous. I'm from Northumberland. And, you know, the biggest landowner in Northumberland came over with William, with William the Conqueror. I mean, right. go figure. <laughs> I always say that, you know, most of, most of the landowners were either bigger bullies or had prettier daughters. Because that's, that's how you got rich. Well, that's the sort of Duke of Westminster's thing, isn't it? About somebody asked him about how how do you how do you become rich like that? And he said, "Well, first of all, you've got to find out whether your ancestors were friends of William the Bastard, yeah. <laughs> because it's it, it's you know you look at it and you think, well, come on, we've still got that going on, and it's like how how does it keep doing that?" You know, and again, it's the way that we think. Yeah, just, I think it's what, it's also what we're used to. Yes. Um, yes. You know, why do we keep voting for Etonians to become prime ministers? I don't exactly. know. It's bizarre. I, I going back to this thing around initiation, you know, um, you're an 11 year old arrives in school. How do you make sure you're not the one that gets beaten up in the dorm at night? Well, you become a clown because it's not cool to beat the clown. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and you build such a false persona that everybody thinks it's wonderful and then votes for it. Exactly. It, that, that thing about surviving when you're not the biggest guy in the, yeah. in the school is you become the person who's, who's quick thinking uh, as a joker. Yeah. Uh, I, certainly, I certainly did that as a kid. Um, you know, I was the one who could, I had all the gags. So, yeah, it's interesting how these things sort of feed through, isn't it? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's an awful lot, and then we're not all going to change it all, all in one go. But what I find encouraging around the whole, you know, plague experience we've had for the last year and a half is a lot of this stuff is now becoming part of everyday conversation. Whereas once upon a time, if you were talking about this stuff, you'd be, you know, pushed off to one corner as a bit left wing or a bit of a hippie. And conversations around climate, conversations about how the world is organized, conversations about alternative economic systems are all now finding their way into, you know, um, not just the hippie festivals, but the dining tables in Chelsea, Knightsbridge and Notting Hill. Um, and I have to have some faith that some, something positive is going to come out of that. Yes, yes. So tell me about what you've been doing recently. Uh, what I've been doing recently, I've, I've been looking at a couple of things. I've been exploring this thing of, 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 of life, life, life change transition, yeah. uh, which, which, which we touched on. And how would you actually put, how would you create a, a local community that could acknowledge what you've been through and have people that could lead you through it? And then the other thing which I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work out how to do, and it's, it's very much a work in progress, is, um, is coaching in, a, in an era of climate change. A lot of coaching, especially business coaching, is totally ascendant. So it was to grow your business and to get bigger and to get more. And that, normally that, that means that's Icarus. Yeah. Except you, you, know, you don't get scorched. Mother Earth gets scorched. And I, I find so I'm, I've actually said I can't be a participant in that. But what I've been, what I found from some workshops that I've done, is if you get a bunch of people and say if you go to your work and you take the passion that you have around your work uh, for, for for climate, and you, what can you do? And they sort of say, well, I'm not allowed to 
take it anywhere I feel embarrassed or I have no sense of hope. And when we workshop that, we actually begin to realize that the person sitting in the next desk also cares deeply about, about the climate. And so um, I've come up with this idea of a, and I should, you know, again, if I'd had this conversation two years ago, it would be mainly youngsters and XR people there. And now I've got, you know, people, serious people in business turning up in these, in, in these workshops. I come up with an idea of a climate initiation and compliance officer where all the good ideas about what your company can do differently can be reported to one person. Mm. And what we're seeing is we are seeing the city and the government slowly getting around to the fact this needs to be legislated. And I'm a great believer we need bottom-up pressure. So, yes, we need to protest, and we also need top-down legislative change. And so, I mean, the, you know, the, the Labour Party had about 52 pages of really solid environmental proposals in their manifesto. Uh, but we're still seeing the ex-chairman of the Bank of England talking about this stuff, lots of different accounting standards around the price of carbon. Um, will you have to actually have a, a, a rolling compliance carbon plan in your accounts if you're going to be a listed company in the UK on the stock exchange? So this stuff is coming, which is the compliance part. So I, I'm, I'm just trying to find ways for people who have the information about how their business is run to actually implement the changes in their own company where they don't feel shame, they don't feel guilty, they can build enthusiasm among their, among their peer group. And, and, and so a way of people having hope, because a lot of what people are looking at is like saying, we're running towards a cliff, but the steering wheels just come off on our hands and the brakes don't work. Mm. You know, it's like a bad Buster Keaton movie. You know, what are we, what are we going to do? And so I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with this, this, this thing of, 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 of climate coaching and saying that every coaching conversation you have has to include a climate piece. Yes. I think once that staff, like, again, you use that term about people not feeling embarrassed, which again comes back to what we were talking about with men recognizing what they've been holding you know, not yeah. embarrassed to show their emotions. It's an interesting point that this, you know, this is one of those sort of social keep everybody in order type of ideas, you know, social pressure thing about embarrassment. Once that gets taken out of that and it's okay to feel these things or say these things. then we've and we got do embarrassment and conformity terribly well in the UK. We do. We do. Um, but I... I I think that, you know, it's, it's so important that we can, again, coming back to the, you know, little bit of a left field turn on this, you know, creativity itself is like that. You know, to be really creative, you, you know, most musicians, most artists are quite embarrassed about putting their work out because they don't want to be criticised, you know? So it seems to be the same type of thing. Once you remove that and you don't give a damn, you just, because it's, it's got to be said, there is something very powerful about removing that thing about being embarrassed or, or whatever, you know. Uh, and, and, and I think the creative field, especially music, you know, don't write me about a song about, don't write me a love song about, about, about the girlfriend that you've lost. Write me a love song about the forest that you walked in as a child. Write me a love song about the ocean that you stand beside every night and watch the sunset. And then I will fall in love with the thing you fall in love with. Yes, that's, that's beautifully put, actually. I think that's, that is so important because, you know, one of, the th <laughs> one of the things I always have to put up with, you know, with people when they first come along and they want to, don't want to express, you know, they want to write songs or whatever. You get the cliches and then you go, right, okay, let's just move them to one side a minute. What is it that you're trying to express? And saying something like that, to them at first is, is quite left field, but it does express deeply what it is that we need to say, you know, really, truly, because again, we're looking for things in people, but really, we really should be looking for things in the world around us, because it's there, isn't it? I, I, I saw this terribly sad piece of research in a state in California where you know, 10 year olds could recognize about 1200 different brands, but they couldn't recognize, couldn't name a single plant in their state. Yeah. But you know, how, can, how, how can you love something that you don't know anything about? Yeah. 
Exactly. You, because nobody's told you, nobody's showing you. And, you know, nobody, you, you know so it, there's, there's an eye-opening. The role of art you know, currently may be also to do some eye-opening and to draw attention to the small and the delicate and the, and the overlooked. Mm. You know, you go to a ritual process and everybody talks about, I'm going to be an eagle or a lion. But, oh. you know, who's going to be, you know, who's going to be the dormouse? Exactly. Who's going yeah. to be the earwig? Yeah, you know, or the slow worm. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you know, and the and the Who's slow worm. You know, the beauty is in the little things. Yeah. It is. It is. Um, yeah, you know, that's a, that's a. That, <laughs> yeah, we could go down a rabbit hole there, but we'll just keep out of that one for a minute. So, when did you make that connection with where you are, with the things that you're you're looking at now? Uh, from when we were talking about those early, well, early initiation processes, but I, I mean, I, I think I said what came out of that was a recognition that it's the cities that need the healing. Mm. So I live in the countryside now, but for a long time, I, I, I felt I needed to stay, you know, in the smoke, quite literally. Um, and it's, it, it's, 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 it was never a light bulb moment. I started off thinking, well, I was going to do coaching because there are a lot of good people in the corporate world who care deeply about these things, but are trapped in a system that doesn't allow them to express themselves, ah. where, you have to park your, where you have to park your personal values at the reception desk. You know, um, none of this is new. You can read Grapes of Wrath. Chapter five, where the bankers are coming in to dispossess the farmers and the bankers feel as guilty as hell. But, and the farmers say, can I go and talk to the man? And there is no man to talk to. It is a system that we are in. Um, there's a book called Swimming with Sharks, where a journalist went to look at the 2008 crash. And he, what he concluded was it's not about getting investment bankers to eat tofu and do yoga before they go work, go, go to their trading desks. They're in a system that requires them to be ruthless and make profits and be cutthroat. So this comes back to the need to actually change the system at a legislative level. You know, um, I can talk a lot about this because I did economics as my major, and I'm not going to get bogged down into it because I'll scare people away. Safe to say the pricing mechanism has a place. Um, we went through a complete resurgence or, or, or an imposition of Friedmanite right-wing economics under, under Thatcher and uh, Reagan, which is what, which is well mapped, and what people are now recognizing is that the price mechanism is very good at allocating resources. It's not something we should use as a value system, no. and this is part of what the, ba the ba chairman of the Bank of England has been talking about. And then you have to start interfering with the market mechanisms. And in some countries, in some part, you know, some parts of America in particular, if you start inter interfering with market mechanisms, you very quickly get you know, be accused of becoming a socialist. And so there's a lot of very emotive language and in-groups and out-groups suddenly appear, and it's very hard to have an in-detailed and in-depth discussion. Um, and I, I do find some frustration. In, is, you know, no, nobody, has, nobody, nobody has yet written um, an update to Keynes's general theory. Keynes wrote the general theory in response to the Great Slump. And what he did was pull together a lot of ideas which were floating around, and he put some of his own genius into it in, in as well. But nobody has yet to pull together all of the ideas which are floating around at the moment in one place that's inspired everybody and said, wow, here, here it all is. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got the internet, and you've got to find a bit here in an article there. You know, so Yanis Fanoufakis has written an amazing book called Another Now, but you've got to stop every two pages to understand what you've just read. Yes, what, yes. What, what, what you've just read. Yeah. Um, where he tries to explain how the economic system would work. And you've got to say, well, what's attainable and what's doable? Mm. Um, and is there political will? And then, you know, and then you come against, you know, a voting system where we're saying, on the one hand, we want to save the planet. On the other hand, you know, we want to have two holidays a year and get on airplanes and fly to different yes. places. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. You've got, you know, and, you know, you, you, you take housing, you know, 40% of the carbon footprint comes out of housing. The top five housing builders in the UK are all major contributors to the Tory party and, the, yes. and, and they got, the, they got some car, higher building regs kicked out in 2016, you know, and so you, you, you're back on the hamster wheel, we all know, and then you go into the despair place. And so, and this is why you need community because it's tough looking at it all by yourself. You've got to have friends. That say, no, no, this just happened. 
and we need some good news because we have this bias towards survival. So we look for bad news. Well, that's just, there is some good news out there. Mm. Um, but we, we, we definitely need to pull together some of the thinking which is floating around. Mm. And we need some, some, some good leaders to stand up and be responsible for it. Mm. A couple of things there. First of all, you know, in, in nature, it's biodiversity to the most ridiculous extreme. We haven't got any, you know, everything tends to end up being focused onto one thing all the time. You know, we get something and everything gets added to that thing. And then everything else that's extraneous to that disappears. And of course, you know, we've, that's not a good recipe for things. It's like having a monoculture, you know, if you have that in, in nature, it doesn't last very long. It gets wiped out by some pest. And of course, you know, we've got, we're sitting on numerous little time bombs like that. And a lot of those things come from, I remember reading something about, I think it was people who are experts in, you know, um, well, in anything. Once you've learnt with somebody, you have to wait till that somebody dies before somebody can come out with another idea, rubbishing the thing that the first person came out with. Right. And um, you can see that in so many things which inhibit how, and um, you know, how things can move forward. Um, and I'm just thinking, well, you know, the, I, from my point of view, you know, this obviously happened within music and in, in, interesting music. There was a great book written. Um, called Noise. I'm trying to think of the guy's name, but he was also an economist, um, a Frenchman. Um, his name eludes me at the moment. But he was saying that music tends to be one of the things that, that's almost a marker to what's coming. You know. So if you look at what happened with the rise of the CD player and you know CDs, and how if the, the people who were on that to start with made a lot of money, Right, so the bands around at that time did very well. And then, of course, then it collapsed. The, the musical industry collapsed because obviously after a while, everybody could record their own stuff and because of technology, you know, supply and demand, etc. cetera. And he, what he was saying was that that's what will happen elsewhere. You know, subsequently you get things from you know, journalism, books, all the rest of it, and the massive changes that have happened. And you think, well, maybe getting some sort of diversity in the way that people think about things is a good thing. Maybe this thing with the, the, um, this pandemic might be the, the type of thing where people start to think, well, hang on a minute, how do we end up with this? You know, how did this develop? What, you know, we've been listening to this and, and get people just thinking, maybe that's, that's something that will come out of this. As you're saying, there may be people thinking and talking about things now they weren't before because they were just trying to not rock the boat. But now it's like, well, maybe we do need to rock the boat. I, I, I think it's difficult because on the one hand, thinking and finding is quite tiring. Mm. And, it, you know, it's, it's far easier just to, you know, nod at the headlines and then go off and watch Love Island. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. You know. Um, and again, so there's a, there's a price, there's a, there's a price there. You know, are you the one moody person down the pub who worries about what's going on in the environment while your mates are busy watch, watching the football match? Um, and at the same time, there are a lot of people who are concerned about these things. And I, I think very often people feel they are the outsiders, but you know, classically we probably you know, there's a lot more outsiders than we actually realize. Um, the question is, how do you find good information? And you know, a lot of what's gone on um, in, in American politics, you know, people have actually been actively looking for answers, but they have you know they've been misfed information or. In a, in a time of huge insecurity, we tend to jump into groups and get our strength from the group. And the way, easiest way to make your group even stronger 
is then to out and criticize the other group. Yes. So you end up with factionalism rather than proper debate. Um, and, 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 and so while at the same time we have a seeking after truth, we also have an ownership of truth. You know, life, we, we now live in a world that demands we're binary. Yes. You know, black or white. Yes. Whereas my experience of life is it's perpetually gray. Yes. The occasional flashy color. Yes, exactly. This yeah, is what I'm saying yeah, about it, diversity. And it, and, and it requires a lot of, you know, and when you're scared, it requires a lot of compassion and a certain amount of inner strength to accept uncertainty. You know, if all we're trying to do is run around, you know, I think people probably familiar with the phrase, phrase confirmation, confirmation bias. Mm. You know, if I ignore everything which challenges what I do, um, then nothing is going to change and I'm just going to stay in my group. Mm. Um, safe to say one of the richest men in the world, who's a fund manager, you know, is famous for getting over his opinions. You know, he'd be invested in an opinion, get new data and change his mind quickly. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, in, in a world of plague, in a world that the world was very uncertain with, you know, with the internet, the breakdown of social democracy and the climate change, all kind of big psychic threats even before the virus came along. Mm. So I think on one level, there's a lot of core fear and people are looking for answers and looking for things to align themselves with. And if you haven't got the courage to go on turning the pages and asking the question, it's scary. And so you're going to, you're going to put up with a half truth or a soundbite. You know, the nature of, you know, how can you have a serious conversation in 160 characters? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So what, if people are interested in what you're, what you're saying, is there any way that they can sort of, communicate with yeah people. i mean so the i i have a i have i have a coaching site which is called greenwavecoaching.com uh most of what i'm doing there is i'm talking about um i coach people in their 20s because i think that's a really really hard time of life i spend a i, I take teenagers sailing in the north sea and i see how beautiful they are in their in, in their teens and it breaks my heart to think how so much of that's going to find no place to go and be dried up by their twenties. And so my I coach twenties to help them hang on to the gold. And then the other piece that I have is this climate coaching piece. And then I do executive mentoring because, you know, I, I've, I've been, I've, I've, I've been through the trenches on that one and taken a company all the way through the stock market and blah. Um, so there's, there's greenwavecoaching.com. And then the other thing on the, I'm actually going to give Annie Spencer a plug because she has some stuff about rites of passage and coming of age. And she is, a, I think it's, it's heart, Hartwell. Um, yes, it is. It is. Uh, She's yes. obviously, I, 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 I did an interview. interview. Yeah. So, yeah. You, 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 you. Um, so she on. has a lot of stuff. Yeah. So she has a lot of stuff about, about initiation and, and rites of passage. And that's going to be an ongoing thing that we hopefully we'll be doing more of. And we're not quite sure when um, or how. Uh, so those, those those are the two things that I'm interested in, and where, where and where people can get back in touch with me. Great, brilliant. Well, I'll put all that stuff in the show notes anyway, and I'll put Annie's link on there again as well because it's um, uh, you know, for, for people yeah. to be in contact with Annie. Yeah, that's brilliant, John. Well, thank thanks ever so much for your time, and um, it's always a pleasure. To no, talk that was to fun. You. I had no idea where it was going to go. It wasn't as scary as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> you know me. No. <laughs> Yeah, you and I know me as well. That's what I was worried about. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right. So thanks ever so much, and we'll catch up for that drink. Great. You should have had. Thank you, very much. Cheers, mate. Speak right. to you. Take care. Big thanks to John. Um, as usual, contact details are on the show notes, as is all the stuff about Blues Camp and the Akara charity and so on. Um, yeah, if you want to check out the um, Annie Spencer episode, um, I'll put a link to that as well. So until next time, see you then. Mm-hmm.